Juan. Booster ignition and liftoff of Atlantis on a mission to study planet Earth. Roll call to Houston. Roger roll, Atlantis. Houston now controlling Atlantis. Is that Welcome once again to Captain Fred's Aviation Theater. We have a very special guest with us today, space shuttle astronaut Ellen Ochoa. Ellen, welcome to Aviation Theater. Thank you, Captain Fred. We have a lot of territory to cover today, so let's get started with Ellen Ochoa from La Mesa, California. You went to elementary school, is, was it Northmont? That's right, Northmont Elementary. Northmont Elementary, and then you went to junior high uh, in a miniature golf course. Right next to it. Right next anyway. door to a miniature golf Parkway course. Parkway Junior High. Parkway Junior High, and that golf course, uh, I think they tore it down and built a freeway. <laughs> That's right. But the school is still there. The school is still there, sure. Then you went across the freeway, up on top of the hill, to Grossmont High School. Grossmont High, right. And there was another astronaut who went to Grossmont High School. Bill Anders is Bill also Anders. from Grossmont High. So you and Bill Anders, uh, two astronauts from Grossmont High School. And we actually have a third now, Rick Sturkow, who was picked as an astronaut about two years ago, also from Grossmont High. And you were valedictorian at Grossmont High School. That's right. Then you went to San Diego State University, mm -hmm. just, just down the hill. You actually, <laughs> you stayed in the neighborhood. And once again, you were valedictorian of the whole institution, not, not just your class. You were valedictorian of San Diego State University. That's right. And then after graduating there, you went on and you earned, you got a bachelor's degree there, mm -hmm. and you went on and you earned your master's degree, and you were then welcomed into the Guild of Scholars. You <laughs> earned your Ph.D. That's right. And your Ph.D. was in optics or what field of science? It was in the electrical engineering department, but my area of research focused in optics, optical mm -hmm. information processing. How did you get from optical information into the space program? Well, in the space program these days, they look for people with all kinds of science and engineering backgrounds, people who have a good broad education in math and science in general. So they're not necessarily looking for people just with aviation experience or aerospace education, but uh, anyone who has a good background in science. And because a lot there. of it is studies now. They're, they're, they, they've conquered space, so now they're starting to study some of the various aspects of it. Well, a lot of what we do on the shuttle mm -hmm. is science experiments and technology experiments, and they may, may be in any of those fields, not just aviation, and therefore they like people with a different backgrounds and broad backgrounds. When you went into the space program, uh, tell us about that. Well, that was uh, seven years ago when I was selected by NASA. And uh, the first year, my class, all the people that were selected the same year mm -hmm. I was, there were 23 of us, uh, went through a training program together. And it's a lot like going to school. We read workbooks, we get lectures, and we work in uh, specialized trainers that uh, teach us all about how to use the shuttle systems. So a lot of it is really learning how to operate a spacecraft, how to diagnose when there's problems, and how to recover from malfunctions. And what was your assignment uh, in the space program? Was it in optics or, or? Well, as an astronaut, they really don't give you a, a narrow assignment. They expect that you have a, the kind of background that you can learn about any experiment they need to do. And uh, they feel free to assign astronauts to any flight really no matter what your background is. And you were assigned to play the flute <laughs> in space. That, that's the famous photograph. Uh, <laughs> I have a book, and your picture's on the cover, it? and it shows you with your hair floating up above <laughs> your head playing the flute in space. So you're probably the most famous musician in the world. <laughs> well, it's, uh, playing the flute has been a hobby of mine ever since I was in uh, elementary school. And so when I had the chance to tape, take a couple of items with me into space, that was a, a natural choice for me. So I mm -hmm. got to do that on my first flight. Now, I want to mention to our viewers, uh, you are the inventor of and hold the patents on three uh, inventions. Mm -hmm. uh, would you tell us about those three? Because uh, make it simple so that <laughs> I can understand it. They're all to do with optics, I believe. That's right. Uh, what would be the first one? 
Well, this was some research work that I did at Stanford as part of my doctoral research along with my professors. And uh, the general area of research is to use optics rather than electronics to operate on images to get extract information from images. Is it fiber optics or something completely different? We don't really use fibers. We're using... You're even beyond that now. Oh, well, you were using holograms and lasers. Mm -hmm to operate on images and you can really look at an image all together at once rather than having to scan line by line as a computer normally does. And the first patent dealt with looking for defects in objects, for example, periodic objects that you might be looking at on an assembly line. And what is a periodic object? Is that like a, a crankcase on a, a, a car or object. something like that? We were looking at like semiconductor masks for mm -hmm. the semiconductor industry. And it would detect a crack or something a in defect it? A in defect it. of some right. kind. Yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And you got that while you were still a, a doctoral student at Stanford? We applied for it then. You applied for it. By the time we actually got it, I was out of school, but it was part of that work. Well, when uh, when we started Aviation Theater in 1990, uh, we copyrighted it, mm -hmm. and it took a year and a half. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I understand how that goes. So uh, that was your first one. Right. Uh, then uh, you got your Ph.D., mm -hmm. and uh, did you immediately go into uh, the space program with NASA? No, I worked as a research engineer at Sandia National Labs in Northern California, and the other two patents were with inventors, uh, other people I worked with at Sandia, we together invented a couple mm -hmm. of other... Can you tell us about the second one? The second one was a way of detecting objects in an image, for example, airplanes on an airfield, for example, and looking at how to automatically detect them with optics no matter what size or what orientation they might show up in the image. This would be uh, like an airplane that uh, was camouflaged or something, and you could still see through it like x-ray or, or what? No, it's more... Uh, if you are trying to do an autonomous uh, terrain navigation or autonomous location of objects on the ground, so you don't have anybody uh, being able to use their eyes to pick out an object and you want to let the automatic system be able to pick out a certain object, but you don't know what orientation it might show up in or how big or how small it might be. Okay. And the third one. The third one was a way of re removing random noise from an image to help clean it up and make it more... Now, I, I, I can speak to that <laughs> one. Uh, in, uh, in movies and in television, uh, what, what most people would call static is called noise. Right. So when you say you're removing noise, you could be removing static from a TV image or something like that. Right. Uh, most people would call it static, but scientifically it's noise. Mm -hmm. okay. yes. See? I got that one right. I understood that one. <laughs> And then you were accepted uh, from uh, well, this? Well, from Sandia, I went to work for NASA, but not as an astronaut. At oh, you went to work for NASA, at Ames but research not as an astronaut. As a, again, as a research engineer and mm -hmm. then as a manager of other researchers, other scientists and engineers. Well, I'm familiar with the concept that you promote from within. That's right. <laughs> so that's what happened to you. Yes. Uh -huh. And so then uh, you went to work uh, not as an astronaut, right. but as an employee and proved your mettle, no, <laughs> no pun intended, and uh, then you were chosen as a, an astronaut right. candidate, and you went through, was it 26 weeks? How long is the school that you went through? Well, it's approximately a year long before you're eligible to be assigned as an astronaut to a shuttle mission, a little less than a year. Mm -hmm. And uh, you served your year, and uh, let me see if I remember correctly now, April 19... 83? 93. 93, April 1993, uh, you went up on your first mission. That's right. Uh, would you tell our viewers about that? Now, this, the space shuttle was a new concept at that time. Uh, we had just recently, uh, uh, I don't know, several, uh, several missions uh, that they had used the space shuttle. Before that, uh, the rockets were like Kleenex. You know, you use one and throw it <laughs> away. But I remember at the time that Congress said they're spending a lot of money creating the space shuttle, but that in the long run they're saving money because you use it over and over again. So there hadn't been very many space shuttles before you went up. Well, actually, there had been over 50 flights. Is we were, that right? We were the 56th uh, mission. I can't. 
In a space and shuttle? In a space shuttle. I can't believe it's been that many. And we've had uh, well over 80 flights now. So Is that right? I think it's something maybe people don't realize because all the flights aren't covered as extensively as they Thank used to be. Thank you for giving me an out. Because, <laughs> because I like they're to, more routine now. I we like to think that uh, I'm, I'm knowledgeable and well-versed <laughs> in aviation. But if there were 50 yes. before you, then... Uh, it, they're not all covered by TV. Is that what it is? Not as much anymore. Not, not by network. More routine. We have yeah. seven or eight a year, and mm. uh, they go up quite regularly. <laughs> well, I'll be. Well, I learned something today. Uh, they say though that the reason, anytime there's an airplane crash, it's the it's the lead item on all the news shows, and the reason is that it's something new, so, something unusual. But there's 500 car wrecks on the freeway every day, and they don't cover those. So I guess uh, the space shots and the shuttle missions have become commonplace, and uh, we just don't realize how many it's been. Uh, Deputy Barney Fife on the Andy <laughs> Griffith Show, uh, some guy asked him one time, he said, didn't, didn't you win an Oscar or an Emmy? And he said, yeah, I won five consecutive Emmys for playing Deputy Barney Fife. And I guess you just got accustomed to seeing him <laughs> getting those Emmys and you didn't realize how many it was. I'd like you to tell our viewers about your first mission. Well, actually, both of my missions were atmospheric research flights. So the main goal... Okay, let, let me repeat that. Okay. Atmospheric research right. flights. But you're out of the atmosphere. You're, <laughs> you're up in orbit where there isn't any atmosphere. That's why we actually go into space to do this, because it's difficult to get measurements at uh, all different altitudes through the atmosphere when you're on the ground. When you're in space, it's a lot easier to scan through the different altitudes and take measurements at every layer about what chemicals are there. And we were specifically looking for ozone and for the chemicals that cause ozone depletion. And, of course, with, with you being a specialist in optics, uh, you would use some kind of uh, equipment that would do exactly that. Yes, a lot of the instruments had a lot of optical components with them, and some of them were familiar to me because of the background that I had. Mm -hmm. But as I mentioned, uh, even though we didn't have an atmospheric chemist or an atmospheric physicist on board, because all of the astronauts have a good science and engineering background. Plus, you could analyze that after you got back down, right. couldn't you? We were able mm -hmm. to learn how the instruments operated and how to monitor and help keep them running. Um, you were in orbit then the whole time? This, the, the, the shuttle went up and you went around the Earth My in orbit? My flight was nine days, right. Nine, nine days. days. Mm -hmm. Okay, we want to hear more about that <laughs> right after we come back from this very important message. Welcome back to Captain Fred's Aviation Theater, and we want to continue with the adventures of Ellen Ochoa, space shuttle astronaut. Uh, would you tell us about your second mission? Now, your first one was April 93. That's right. And uh, your second one was November 94, 18 months later. That's right. Okay. What were you looking for, or what were you assigned to do when you went up on your second mission? Well, the interesting thing was it was the follow-up mission to the first in that we were flying the same instruments and because we were studying the atmosphere on both flights, we were trying to look at changes in the atmosphere between those two times. And partly those changes are due to time of year, but also to the cycle of the sun, depending on whether it has a maximum of sunspots or a minimum. And it does change in that amount of time. And so we had not only atmospheric instruments measuring chemicals in our atmosphere, but also instruments measuring the sun, how much radiation we were receiving from the sun. Mm -hmm. Now the sunspots give off uh, interference that causes uh, static and interruption of radio and That's television right. and other things, uh, which are invisible. But uh, with your optics, could you see them or through filters or something? Well, what we were really looking at is it affects the amount of radiation that the Earth receives from the sun as well. 
and we were measuring that amount of radiation or energy and especially looking at how much was in the ultraviolet region because that affects the ozone layer directly. Ultraviolet light is the energy for the chemical reactions in the atmosphere that help create and destroy ozone. So part of learning about the atmosphere is understanding how the sun might be affecting it as well. When we have a sunspot, or when there are sunspots, mm -hmm. does that produce more radiation and more ultraviolet light? Generally, there is a, a correlation. There, there's what they call an 11-year solar cycle when the energy we receive from the sun goes from a maximum to a minimum and back to a maximum over 11 years, and this cycle repeats. And generally at the maximum is when you see more of the sunspots, and at the minimum you see less. But that doesn't mean on a day-to-day -day basis you might have that, but over a period of time you see that kind of correlation. Now, an 11-year cycle, mm -hmm. uh, does that have to do with the Earth tilting or the uh, sun they moving? They actually or, or do what? not understand the origin of that cycle and what causes it and what causes it to be 11 years. That's still one of the things we have not yet learned. So they've just done measurements and, right. and they've discovered through that. measurements mm -hmm. that they understand there is mm -hmm. that. I was going cycle. to say that sometimes you go up for your second mission because you, you had more questions than answers on your first mission, and, and you have to go back again a second time. Uh, which one of the missions did you play the flute in, or both? It was the first mission. It was the that first I had one? The flute with me, yes. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And uh, I don't know how many books. Bill, Bill Anders told me that uh, if he had a penny, for every photograph that was published of, of the earth rising above the moon. Yeah, you remember that photograph? Yes. Oh. He said he wished he had a penny <laughs> for every one of those. So if, if, if you had a penny for every photograph of you playing the flute in space, <laughs> uh, you would be wealthy. Uh, what else happened on your second mission? Well, on both my flights, I also operated the robotic arm that we... That was the other thing that I wanted to ask you about was mm -hmm. uh, robotics. And uh, that's a tool that we have on the shuttle. We don't have it on every flight, but many flights we do use it to pick up something out of the payload bay of the shuttle and move it around. In our case... Now, what is the payload bay of the shuttle? This is something you're going to deliver in space? Well, the payload bay is the, the main part of the shuttle, the long por portion of the fuselage, you might mm -hmm. call it. And we bring up... Uh, the science experiments or the satellites, whatever the main goal of the mission is. You know, is, I remember the word there. Spartan now. Yes, that was uh, from my first flight. On your first flight, you helped to capture or deploy recapture, and capture. deploy and recapture the Spartan right. satellite. And on my second flight, we had another satellite called Christus Paz, which we also deployed and captured. And in both cases, they had science instruments on board. And for those science instruments to work properly, they wanted to be away from the area of the shuttle. Free floating. Which can uh -huh. uh, cause some contamination. Mm -hmm. And so we would deploy it. We would go off and take measurements, and then we'd come back a few days later, rendezvous with it, and then I would use the arm to actually capture it and put it back into the payload bay to bring it back to Earth. I find it interesting that uh, on the one hand, uh, you were doing optics, that is... Uh, leading, cutting edge, leading scientific matter, optics that even after you explain them, I don't understand them. <laughs> uh, and then on the other hand, you were doing just plain old mechanical robotic arm, reach over, pull the lever and grab it. You know, I used to put a, a nickel in a machine and, and there would be a claw that would go down and I'd try to get a, 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 a jawbreaker or a gumball or something. And essentially that's what robotics is, what you're talking about, isn't it? It has some relationships to flying as well because you do have two hand controllers and you're controlling your position with one of them and then your attitude, your pitch yaw and your roll with the other hand controller. It would be like landing on a carrier because right. the landing field is going up and down and around and, and you're moving all at the same time. So I, I can see that it would require some finesse. But uh, it, it is a, a mechanical thing. The robotics right. is right. mechanical. We have an electrical arm on board and it has many different joints. It's very much like your own arm. It has a shoulder, two shoulder joints, an elbow joint, and three wrist joints. And you can move them all together by using the hand controllers or you can move just one joint at a time using a different set of controllers. I believe I saw some footage on that and, and the hand or the, or the claw, what, what do you call it? Well, it's not really a claw. We have uh, what we call an end effector, but it, inside, which you can't see very well, it has mm -hmm. a snare and with the targets that we come up, we, we capture over a pin and then the snare helps grab it. And it could either 
crush a baseball into powder, or it could pick up an egg without breaking the shell. So it goes from one spectrum to the other. After you made your second flight, uh, did you continue with NASA? Yes, I'm still with NASA. I spent about two years working on developing the International Space Station, which we're going to start launching next year. This is a manned, international yes, manned space that's right. station. That's right. Uh, that's right, out of 2001 Space Odyssey. It's something we've been planning for a long time, but uh, we've actually built quite a bit of hardware now, probably over a couple hundred thousand pounds between the U.S. and some of the other countries that we're working with, which includes Russia, Japan, uh, many of the European countries, and Canada. And uh, we have a number of uh, flights of the shuttle over several periods, several years, that we will take up equipment and put it together using robotics and using. And you will actually assemble a assemble space station space. up there, just like in space in 2001. Right. It will actually be that. So that's something to look forward to starting about next summer is the first launch. Uh, and you're based at uh, Houston? That's right, Johnson okay. Space Center. Johnson Houston. Space Center. Would you tell us just a little bit about the Johnson Space Center and what you do? Sure. Uh, you don't have to worry now about uh, Russia attacking us with an atomic warhead missile. So uh, tell our viewers about what you're doing there at the Johnson uh, Space Center. Well, one of NASA's big programs, obviously, is the human exploration and development of space. And Johnson Space Center is the NASA center that's in charge of leading that whole effort. So, for example, it is the center where all the astronauts train, and we have uh, not only our offices there, but a lot of training facilities. Uh, we have training facilities for the robotics, for the spacewalks that we do, and for operating the shuttle in general, especially on launch and landing, which are the two very dynamic phases of flight. Now that Russia as we know it, mm -hmm. or the USSR as we used to know it, uh, has, I don't know the right word, dissolved, disintegrated, splintered, um, the United States is the space exploration country. So uh, are we training people from other countries? We have a number of astronauts from other countries and we've flown many astronauts from different countries over many years. Of course, Russia still has a space program that has made many great accomplishments. Well, that was my ne that was my next question. Including having a um, space station already. Is the trouble with Mir, M I R Mir, mm -hmm. th Mir, that they didn't have uh, sufficient optics? <laughs> well, I think the only trouble is is that it was designed to last five years in space, and it's been in space eleven years. Is so, that right? Uh, like anything, of course, the parts are wearing out. Now they have spare parts on board or they can send them up from the ground so the kinds of things that are breaking are things that they can fix in general. Okay, I have a question. Uh -huh. Why would a spaceship uh, that was designed for five years still be up there after nine years? Well they designed a couple of newer modules and they took a little longer to develop than they first originally planned partly because of finances which is something the US knows quite well too and so those modules didn't get up there till uh, a couple of years ago and they wanted to their science laboratory modules which is one of the goals of their station and so they wanted to try to use those modules to do experiments for a few years before they would have to uh, discontinue using mm -hmm. the station. Now you're working on the uh, the, the coming space, the International, the International Space Station. Space station. Right. That's your current assignment? Uh, up until a few months ago it was. Uh, now I work in mission control as one Oh, of I know the, that word. I know mission control. <laughs> as one of the astronauts that talk to crews when they're on orbit. You probably know that the voice that you hear coming from Houston is always an astronaut. The person, mm -hmm. the people that talk to crews when they're on orbit are also astronauts. Was Deke Slayton the first one, I believe? He, he, he may have He's been the, the one first. that they, they said had a heart murmur yes, and, and he and couldn't fly. He didn't fly, so he spent mm -hmm. a lot of time in mission control. But we always have, oh, a half dozen astronauts or so assigned to that job when they're not training or flying in space to be talking to astronauts. Because. Uh, you speak a common language. That's you, right. you, you know what to we've, say. We've been up there. We're very familiar mm -hmm. with the shuttle and all the switches and the way that you would operate it. And so we sort of bring that familiarity with us to that job. Okay. And you're here in San Diego today uh, as a guest of the Aerospace Museum uh, as a part of the lecture series. Uh, we want to thank you very much for taking the time to be with us. Uh, 
Would you want to tell our viewers just quickly about the Aerospace Museum? Well, sure. I'll especially talk a little bit about my role in it, but one of the things that the Aerospace Museum does is bring in guest speakers uh, for people who are interested in what goes on at the museum, and that might be both in aeronautics and in space. And uh, this month there is a special on astronauts who are from San Diego or who have lived in San Diego. So I'll be talking about my experiences, uh, showing a movie, and answering lots of questions, I hope. We're very proud to have Ellen Ochoa with us today uh, for several reasons. One is that uh, she's a space shuttle astronaut. Uh, the other one is that she's uh, from San Diego, not native. Uh, I, I studied your biography, but, uh, but you went to school here and you consider yourself uh, a San I've Diego. I've lived here since I was a year old. So One year? <laughs> that, that's close enough. Uh, and also because she's active with uh, girls. Uh, she helps tell the girls uh, that you need to get an education, stay in school, learn arithmetic. Uh, in the last minute or so, you have any special message for our viewers? Well, I always like to tell students, and especially girls who are often not as encouraged to take math and science as others, that what got me my job and all the interesting experiences I had is certainly my education especially studying math and science, but it's extremely important to finish high school, go on to college, and study what you are interested in and work hard. That's what uh, got me my job and all the exciting things I've been able to do, and it really opens doors for you. Thank you very much for being with us today. Ellen Ochoa, Space Shuttle Astronaut.